Today's topic for the Brain Ponderings podcast is ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, motor neuron disease. And my guest is an expert on this. Uh, he's a neurologist, neuroscientist, Kevin Talbot at Oxford University, where he's head of the Newfield Department of Clinical Neurosciences and head of the Oxford Motor Neuron Disease Center, which I think Dr. Talbot was a founder of. And he has done research over the last 20 plus years, uh, both the clinical research, basic research, genetics of ALS, which there's a lot of interesting genetics involved. And so today he's going to tell us about his clinical experience, how he diagnoses ALS, um, something on demographics and risk factors, and then we'll get into the genetics, what he and, and others think are going on in the, the motor neurons that degenerate in ALS. And then finally, what treatments are available now and what's on the near term and maybe more distant horizon. So Kevin, it's, it's good to have you on this podcast. I know um, from experimental standpoint, our, if not directly, sort of indirectly, our paths have crossed because we have a lot of interest in some of the same mechanisms that may be happening in neurons in other neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, which I worked on a lot. Yeah, well, so can you first for the uh, to to participate? I'm very glad to to be doing it. Thanks. Can you can you first talk about well maybe talk about your own background? You you spent you grew up in England and you've stayed there. Uh, pretty much. So yeah, I mean, I I grew up in uh, London. My parents actually uh, were both Irish, so I'm I'm genetically Irish, of which I'm very proud. And. Um, you know, I, I, I had a conventional kind of South London childhood and uh, became interested in science, although I was interested in everything, really. Uh, wanted to be a physicist initially. I, I really thought particle physics, physics was what I wanted to do. But actually, I took uh, a year between school and university and went off and worked in a hospital in Jerusalem. It's completely by chance this, this came my way. But actually, I worked with children with neuromuscular disease who, who were essentially dying of Duchenne and spinal muscular atrophy and other conditions. And that really just made me realize that, uh, you know, I was interested in, in how things work, how things go wrong, but also having some impact in that. And I wasn't likely to do that through physics and I probably wasn't clever enough to be a, a physicist. So um, I then, uh, so I had three years between school and university actually, um, which you know kind of gets lost in your CV with time. You stop putting it in there, and but people don't realise that you know for three years I just had a sort of education of personal growth and did all sorts of jobs and various things before going to university, which I think has, has been a good thing. But I arrived at university kind of really a little bit rusty and mm. full of uh, ideas about uh, about medicine and society and philosophy and things like that, but. It wasn't until I started seeing patients that I really became utterly fascinated and compelled to what's actually going wrong deep inside at the cellular level. And I think then I had this kind of transformational sense that I really wanted to both uh, look after patients, but also really understand what's going on in a very mechanistic, possibly reductionistic way. And that's how one understood disease and how one treated it ultimately. So that's really what set me off the, on the path of a clinician scientist. So I had the opportunity to take a year out and do an extra degree. And I worked in the genetics laboratory of John Hardy in uh, in London, uh, just, just around the time they were identifying the APP mutation. So that taught me that, this was in the late eighties, and that taught me that in my working lifetime, through molecular genetics, we were going to understand things that we previously had no hope of understanding. And it's turned out that way. It's taken rather longer than people imagined to come up with therapies that that work you know i remember very clearly when the duchenne gene was cloned you know of course everyone thought there were a couple of years and then there'd be a treatment and that's still not treatable actually so that's very sobering and very important you know it tells but you know what we know about the brain now through the human genome project and understanding the way that dna and rna are, are you know processed in the nervous system in a very distinct way has actually completely transformed our view and actually ALS is a very good example of a disease which which kind of demonstrates how uh, 
compartmentalized expression of gene function is possibly a key element to susceptibility. And so when you, so ALS is what is the motor neuron disease that most people have heard of and well, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which, uh, but there, there are some other little more rare, but uh, you know, for those affected, equally important. Can you kind of describe the different motor neuron diseases? Yeah, so I suppose, um, you know, one could go into great detail here, but I think the way that I explain this to students is that we've got to consider that these are not disorders in general of a cell, although that's often how we model them. Um, these are disorders of a complex network, which has evolved for voluntary movement. And that network has many, many millions of connections and oscillations and ramifications that begin in the motor cortex with all of the inputs into the motor cortex descend as the corticospinal tract and then synapse on you know uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord then they go out to muscle so an individual simple movement requires millions potentially certainly hundreds of thousands of computational events so we have to think of these diseases as diseases of a system in my view that's a fundamental concept if we just think it's the cell that's gone wrong we're going to miss the whole point so we divide the system into the corticospinal tract, the upper motion neuron, and the lower motion neuron, the motion neuron in the spinal cord, going out to muscle as the motor unit. So there are diseases of the motor unit, and ALS is a disease of both the corticospinal tract and the motor unit. That's very, very important. So it's often referred to as a neuromuscular disease, but actually I think that's not a good term. It's a corticomotor neuronal disease. Spinal muscular atrophy is a disease of the anterior horn cell in the spinal cord and its connection to muscle. So it's a very pure disease. Hereditary spastic paraplegias, of which there are 80 or 90 genetic variants, are pure diseases of the corticospinal tract. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a system and diseases sometimes uh, are manifestations of polarity of the system. So you may have an upper motor neuron predominant form of ALS or a lower motor neuron predominant form of ALS or pure disorders of the upper motor neuron or the lower motor neuron. And that's in itself a fascinating kind of concept that you can actually disconnect one end of the system without actually uh, compelling the other end of the system to degenerate. And that, that is important, I think. Yeah. Um, so um, that's how we kind of classify these diseases. And the, in this, the sort of lower motion area and motor unit area, ultimately you could include myasthenia gravis, the neuromuscular junction and, and muscle disease and, and axonal polyneuropathies, et cetera. But in terms of motion neuron diseases, really we're dealing with ALS in all its manifestations, we're dealing with spinal muscular atrophy as a pure genetic form of low motor neuron disease. And then there are many other rarer genetic forms which seem to affect low motor neurons either individually or in combination with other cell types. And there are endless numbers of those. But essentially ALS is the archetypal and commonest form of motor neuron degeneration. That's why I really, uh, I work on it. I used to work on spinal muscular atrophy and so I did my PhD on, and that was a tremendous training ground for understanding precision medicine approaches, how genotype phenotype correlations arise, how you model disease in mice and other model organisms, and ultimately how you understand how a housekeeping gene, like the SMN gene, might lead to um, a specific disorder of a particular cell and its connections. But I have to be very clear that 25 years after the gene was identified, there is a very good treatment for SMA, but we're still arguing about what the function of the SMN protein is in a motion neuron. And there are two camps, those who think that it's something wrong with, motion neurons have a higher vulnerability to the canonical mechanism of SMN function, and others, and I'm in this camp, think that it has a specialized function in motion neurons, probably in the distal axon in terms of local translation, for example. So, you know, th there's a, there's a huge amount that's gone on in the last 25 years, and it's been a, been a fantastic journey so far. And can you talk about uh, the demographics of ALS and risk factors? Yeah, well, um, that is a very interesting question, really, because, I mean, the epidemiology of ALS, uh, certainly at a sort of high level, crude level, suggests that doesn't vary very much really from population to population. Now, I mean, the only populations that have been studied properly tend to be those of European genetic heritage in North America, in Europe, 
And typically ALS has a, an incidence of two per 100,000 per year. So two out of every 100,000 people in any population be able to develop ALS. And because it's a short-lived disease, the prevalence is pretty much fixed at around five or six per 100,000 people per population. So that doesn't seem to vary hugely between, you know, London, Baltimore, Sydney, Australia, and Rome. But there's a bit of granularity, and that mostly seems to be driven by genetic founder effects. So 15% of people with ALS will have an identifiable genetic mutation that is likely to be driving their disease. And of course, you know, different populations have different genetic backgrounds. But if you take that aside, so-called sporadic ALS, which is really a complex genetic disease, if you like, probably, that seems to have the same instance everywhere. Now, what does that mean? That means to me that it's the vulnerability of the system, which is the fundamental fault here. And that, uh, you know, it's about being human. It, it probably dates to some aspect of human evolution that has seeded that vulnerability. And it's, it's shared by all humans. Although, actually, interestingly, studies that have been done in people of more recent African heritage, so people uh, of Afro-Caribbean or African-American heritage, for example, and people in sub-Saharan Africa, probably the instance of ALS is about half of what it is in people of white European origin. That suggests that some of the genetic uh, vulnerability might have been acquired in the last 80,000 years in the population that left Africa and, you know, seeded the rest of the world. So, so essentially, superficially, ALS looks like a disease with a fairly uniform incidence, apart from a bit of gene genetic granularity. So that suggests that perhaps it's not an environmentally driven process, or at least the environment that drives it is common to all of us and is probably very much an, an aging process. So, so I think that it's been very, very unrewarding up to now to actually start studying cause and effect. Now, there are ways of doing it in an unbiased fashion, but invariably, there's a lot of biases creeping in. People have preconceived ideas about heavy metals or organophosphates or whatever it might be. And then they ask questions about that and there's recall bias. And these kind of studies are essentially kind of useless in my view. But where these things have been studied in a very prospective and unbiased way, you know, we are more likely and combining that with genetic um, studies, genomic studies, we might start to learn a bit more about why some individuals get ODS and some don't. But at the moment, it's not entirely clear that the environment has a very strong cause. I remember when, uh, this is a long time ago, 25, 30 years ago, you know, there's this number of papers coming out on this ALS Parkinson's dementia complex of Guam, which is kind of an interesting story. It's certainly not pure ALS as you typically see it, but the motor neurons do degenerate. And in that case, there did seem to be an environmental cause because when that, this was kind of an indigenous people on these islands, they were developing this syndrome, which includes motor neuron degeneration. And then they became sort of westernized. They changed their diet. You know, some of them moved yep. to the United States and, and it kind of disappeared when some apparent and, and we, maybe we'll talk a little bit later of this process called excitotoxicity, where neurons can be excited to death. But there was some evidence, and then it kind of fizzled out, and I don't know what the current thinking on is, that there was something in their diet that... Yeah. Was... Well, I mean, it's a fantastic story. And, of course, it does demonstrate. I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying that environmental causes could not cause neurodegeneration. There are many examples. That is a good example. Conzo is a good example in Africa of a clear, you know, cycad poisoning. I mean, there are a number of examples. But, I mean, that that, that, that story, the Guamanian ALS-PDC complex story, is a kind of red flag for anybody who thinks you can sort out this. It's almost like the perfect population. It's an island, you know, you've got a captive population. It's very genetically homogeneous because they all migrated there in the, in the 1600s. And you've got a monophasic epidemic. I mean, it should be a perfect setting in which you can study, but actually people have failed really yeah. to nail it. Yeah. And um, that's interesting in itself. It's a bit of a kind of, you know, warning for anybody who thinks you can sort this out very easily. Um, but I, so I didn't think it's clear. Um, 
that what really caused that caused that at all actually um it does seem to be an environmentally driven but i think it's going to disappear into the realms of history without a real clear cause it also occurred in, in similar disease pathologically occurs in a particular peninsula in japan and in an area in papua new guinea so pathologically these are tauopathies that look uh very similar so uh yeah very puzzling so i don't i don't know if we really understand how that happened yeah Okay, when someone comes to the clinic, how do you diagnose ALS? So it really uh, rests on very traditional neurological skills. You know, um, myself and Sharko in the 19th century could probably quite happily do a joint clinic and come to the same kind of conclusions by examining, by taking a history fundamentally and examining. So it turns out that if you simply say to a patient, tell me what the main problem is, uh, they will have a very clear answer if the diagnosis turns out to be ALS. And the answer is, I have had problems with one upper limb 30% of the time, one lower limb roughly 30 to 35% of the time, or my speech has become slurred 30% of the time. That counts for most patients. And then if you say, when did it start? When did you first notice this? They can give you a month and a year pretty right. precisely. And then if you say, well, tell me what happened next, there is a story of linear progression of disability. So you've got a disorder which is painless, involves progressive loss of motor function, whether that be in speech or in movement of the limbs, and there isn't an obvious other explanation. So when you examine people, you find evidence of involvement of the corticospinal tract. You find evidence of involvement of the lower motor neurons through wasting and reduced reflexes and, and weakness and reduced tone. And then you are, you're very likely to image the whole nervous system to make sure there isn't some kind of comorbid or, or some, some structural element that, you know, invariably is not rewarding. And then you do an EMG to, sh to show there's denervation, which in most cases for someone like me is simply telling me what I already know. Where it's extremely valuable is in the, the patients who present with problems in just one limb, which is quite common. And you haven't got good evidence that this is spreading outside of one limb yet. So you find evidence of denervation in areas that are not weak or symptomatic, and that's very helpful because it allows you to make the diagnosis. So this is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on history and examination and the characteristic physical signs. So for example, tongue wasting, you hardly ever see in any other situation. It's based on a lack of another explanation, but all you have to do really is simple imaging. I mean, people go on sometimes an odyssey looking for rare mimics of ALS and this is mostly just not not helpful the diagnosis is not difficult in typical cases and the EMG is there to support the diagnosis but it's not a diagnostic test that's very important and when I've seen errors made it's because people overinterpret the EMG so this is a disease that's made by an expert neurologist a diagnosis made by an expert neurologist who recognizes what they're seeing in front of them can you talk, so you mentioned John Hardy and he, so I was at National Institute on Aging where John was. Actually, we both uh, were being recruited for lab chief positions at the same time. And uh, and then, you know, he's back in the UK now, as you mentioned, he, he discovered first mutation in amyloid precursor protein that causes its inherited Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, Brian Trainer, who's in Andy Singleton's group at N NIA, uh, found uh, mutations or polymorphisms, I guess you could say, in, in another gene, C9ORF72. Can you talk about the genetics? Because it's it's really proving valuable. You mentioned early on that th there's been you know, a little bit of disappointment in moving clinically from identifying a gene and then trying to understand what that mutation is actually doing in the cells to developing a treatment. But on the other hand, we have now, you know, through your work and a lot of others, some ideas of, you know, the complexity of ALS in terms of genetics and the complexity then in terms of mechanisms. So I guess first talk about the genetics. Yeah, so I mean, there, for, for a long time, it was kind of debated as to whether ALS was particularly genetic, even though actually, if you look at the original families or people studied by early pioneers like Sharko, there's usually some family history in the background. Uh, 
But it became very clear in the 70s and 80s that there were families with autosomal dominant inheritance and through classical linkage approaches, SOD1 was identified in 1993 as the first genetic cause of ALS. And everyone immediately thought, well, this is clearly straightforward. You know, this is a, 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 a protein which is involved in protecting cells from oxidative stress. And therefore, it's very likely that, you know, alterations in the function of this mechanism is going to be driving the disease. But it turns out that through lots of genetic experiments, you can show that this is a gain of function toxicity due to protein misfolding, which probably doesn't always, if, if ever, really easily explain in, in you know, due to the function of SOD1 is not necessarily the issue here. It's, it's, it's acquired sort of toxicity through misfolding. So, so that was an interesting thing. But then the TDP43 was identified as the signature protein in ubiquitinated inclusions in, in ALS. So like other neurogenerative diseases, looking down a microscope, pathologists can produce a taxonomy based on which proteins are lighting up with antibodies. That's a whole other area of interesting debate as to what that means. But TDP43 is the signature protein of ALS because it's present in ubiquitinated inclusions in 97% of cases. And Mutations in TDP43 were identified soon after, you know, in about 2008, telling you that mechanistically this is involved in disease pathogenesis as well as being a signature protein. So that was important in the way that alpha synuclein is important in Parkinson's and the way that uh, APP is important in Alzheimer's. So um, then subsequently, there's been about 20 to 25 or 30 genes, which in small numbers of individuals have been shown to be uh, mutated. And some of these, are there's good evidence for, some less good evidence for, but collectively, it tells you that there are multiple upstream genetic determinants, even in the Mendelian forms of disease. And, and then uh, C9 or 72 was um, identified uh, you know, it's on chromosome nine, and it's a linkage in various families. And then when Brian and Rosa Radomakers identified the mutation, it became apparent this was very common. And actually, 10% um, roughly, between eight and 10% of all patients coming to our clinic have a mutation in C972. And that is because if you just open your fridge and you take out all the DNA on so-called sporadic patients, who have no fam obvious family history, you find mutations in C9172 and some of the other ALS genes in those individuals. So that's where you get the 50, so 10% of people have a clear family history, but 15% of people have some kind of genetic determinant that looks like a really strong driver. So that tells you that uh, these are our disease, these are gene mutations which can operate in a pure Mendelian fashion or as uh, Deter variants which have a strong disease determining effect. So it's a form of variable penetrance, I guess. Um, and that makes it more complicated. It makes it more complicated to understand um, how you counsel people and their families. But actually it, it tells you that you can live with most genetic mutations probably for, well, you, obviously you can for many decades in all cases of ALS. So, you know, people who get genetic disease get it roughly in their fifties and sixties typically. So they've lived for decades tolerating these mutations. So when we then in the laboratory turn around and try and make models of toxicity, which is very easy to do generally, we are possibly approaching it from the wrong angle. We should be asking how you can tolerate a C9 or 72 hexanucleotide expansion. And that's a more difficult question to answer, but that's a much more important question. Um, so, so you've got this very complex genetic architecture because it's pretty clear that the, the other 85% of patients are likely to have genetic determinants. So GWAS studies now are getting up to the 25,000 number in ALS and are starting to show peaks. You know, there are four or five other uh, interesting peaks. And so you've got a, a very complex genetic architecture. You've got people with pure Mendelian dis disease. You've got people at the other end, you don't have any clear, you know, very, it must be a whole concatenation of very small effects. And then you've got everything in between. So, and you've got these things which are tolerated for decades, which tells you that this is a multiple hit process. Whatever your genetic susceptibility is, other things have to happen. And those things are age dependent events in the nervous system. And uh, my colleague, Amar Al-Chalabi Kings did a very nice study where he 
plotted the log of the instance of a disease at a particular age versus the log of the age, and you get a straight line. And to genetic epidemiologists, that means that there's a multiple hit process, and the number of hits required is the slope my, n minus one, where n is the slope of the graph. And it turns out, therefore, that there are, a bit, are five or six hits required to cause ALS. Yeah. If you have a C9072 mutation, you do the same experiment, it's about two or three hits, which is really tells you that's that why you get this variation in manifestation. But the point being, having a mutation in, in a, is not a sufficient condition for the disease. You know, you need other things to happen. And that's, that's optimistic because it means if you knew what those other things were, you may have multiple ways in to prevention of disease and even therapy of disease. Now you, so you mentioned that the, the neurons seem to, the neural system seems to, does resist the the development of functional deficits anyway you know for decades and you know six decades for example and all in case of alzheimer's it's interesting because you get the accumulation of the amyloid now it's mostly outside of the neurons whereas this tdp43 and als is inside the neurons tau in alzheimer's and other disorders inside but in the case of Alzheimer's, there are some people say that they're 90 years old, they're sharp as a tack cognitively, they pass away and they go to autopsy and they look at their brains and it's loaded with amyloid. With, you know, just at first approximation, that suggests an interesting question. Um, what is it about... <laughs> those people that apparently makes their neurons more resistant to the amyloid. Now in, in motor neuron disease, are there any people you see who have no you know, neurological dysfunction, they die and then you look at their spinal cord or their upper motor neurons and they have a lot of TDP43? So I think the answer to that is no, although I don't know that we ever definitively answered that question. I mean, if you talk to neuropathologists who spent their whole life looking at nervous system they, they don't they don't find that generally mm -hmm. but uh, what's becoming clear is that tdp43 can be can accumulate in response to a whole variety of insults so it's present in about 30 percent of people with clinical alzheimer's in the hippocampus it uh, is present in people who've had vascular injury i mean it's there as a sort of some sort of tissue response in many situations but generally speaking you don't see see that um and i mean it's you could argue that certainly mislocalization of tdp from the nucleus and its accumulation of the cytoplasm looks like a, a particularly injurious thing for a cell because this is a a gene that you know is responsible for the post transcriptional processing of a third of the genome and you know it wouldn't take very much perturbation in its location and it's kind of equilibrium to really be very bad for cells. So, um, I mean, the, the whole issue with Alzheimer's and indeed with Parkinson's, it's very clear in both of those diseases that the, the process begins decades before the patient will present to the clinic. It's, a, it's, an, it's one of the most important unanswered questions in ALS as to whether the same thing applies or whether this is a disease which arises out of essentially a normal nervous system and rather abruptly causes complete catastrophe. So the C9072 mutation is very helpful in that regard because it's enough, it generates enough of a sample size for you to start studying people who are carriers of the mutation who may be some years before they might get the disease. So we, we and others are building cohorts of people and then studying them using, you know, proteomics in the CSF, but also things like magnetoencephalography to look at oscillatory network dysfunction to see whether this is something which is occurring, you know, five or 10 years before they present yeah. or whether, it, you know, they're absolutely fine. And then six months before they go and see a neurologist, something starts to go wrong, which would be the pessimistic answer, because you'd really like to have a window of opportunity in which you can intervene that might be years uh, before you to try and prevent that clinical horizon from, from being hit. Now, the, the most interesting kind of mechanistic finding in, in, in the modern neuron disease research, when you compare to, say, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, is this the nucleus. And, you know, you mentioned the TDP43 is normally in the nucleus, and then in disease, it's 
outside and it's aggregating in the cytoplasm and apparently, you know, playing a role in the demise of the neurons. But then the um, C9RF72 story is also interesting from the standpoint of nucleus. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so I mean, broadly speaking, if you look at the the known function of the 25 or so ALS genes, they divide into three groups. They divide into groups that are involved in RNA processing. And that can be transcription, translation, local translation, transport, translational arrest during cellular stress and all sorts of things. The second group are, are, are genes that seem to encode proteins involved in axonal transport. They're a smaller group, but a, a kind of, it makes sense, you know, these very long nerve cells yeah. might be vulnerable and they tend to be low at low motion neuron predominant disease, which also makes sense. So there's some of those. And then thirdly, it's genes that encode proteins involved in proteostasis itself. So you've got three apparently kind of distinct compartments that either are all ways in to cellular vulnerability or ultimately interact with each other, which is probably more likely. So, you know, an, a, a motor neuron, uh, if you think of it as a sphere and then a long process, uh, and you calculate on the back of an envelope what a percentage of a cell volume is in the process, it's more than 99.5%. And we spend our whole lives looking down the microscope at the cell body and going, oh, look, there's protein misfolding and it's leaving the nucleus. But of course, what's really important in the function of that cell is the axon and the synapse, which we have spent less time looking at. Um, so the question is, do these nuclear proteins and these RNA binding proteins like TDP have a function that is, is also distinct in those kind of cells. And they are all found, found in the axon. They're found as part of ribonuclear protein complexes. TDP is found in the cytoplasm where it's involved in stress granule oh. um, formation. So I think this, the whole story of RNA compartmentalization and response to cellular stress is a really critical part of this, not just the nuclear depletion. I mean, the nuclear depletion, if you really, you model that, it's catastrophic, really. I mean, if you if you remove TDP from the nucleus, that's cell lethal, typically. So um, that might might happen, and you might see that in neuropathology. But whether that's the real event that's sufficiently proximal to the beginning of the disease to either be therapeutically tractable or to really explain the disease, I think is another matter. What definitely happens is that TDP forty three, which does have a sort of uh, equilibrium. Uh, of cycling from nucleus to cytoplasm, it has you know nuclear localization component, etc. Um, once you disturb that equilibrium and it starts to be removed from the nucleus and becomes hyperphosphorylated in the cytoplasm, then you, you you get this loss of balance and progressive nuclear depletion, and that is definitely harmful to the cell. The nucleus pore uh, is also seems to be important, and that's where C9072 comes in. So Jeff Rothstein and others have highlighted abnormalities in the nuclear pore complex. And so, so the relationship between RNA and how it is processed and transported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, how it's translationally repressed in times of cellular stress, all of these things seem to be important in motion neurons. The problem actually, as with many pathological problems, is what comes first? What is the you know, what are the sequence of events? And when you look at neuropathology in the brain, of course, you are often, well, you are looking by definition at the end stage. So I think the we are not very certain about the sequence of events. We have a lot of phenomenological understanding now. We have an embarrassment, really, of different potential pathways that could be going wrong, but we don't understand what, you know, is the main driver to the disease. That, that's really, I think, what's holding us up at the moment. Uh, mitochondria and calcium, yeah. as you know, I've done a lot of work on calcium regulation and relation to Alzheimer's. And so these axons are so long, they go from the spinal cord to a muscle in your foot, for example. And there's got to be energy provided all along that axon and, and in the synapse uh, to keep it viable, keep it functioning, being able to maintain its ion balance after it fires and so on. Um, now, is there evidence that the axon degenerate before 
the cell starts dying? Well, it would be very nice to be able to give you an answer to that, really. I mean, the problem is if you model this in a, you know, in a culture system, so we, we, we do this, others do it, you know, you, you can provide microfluidic chamber systems where you grow the cell bodies and then you track the axons through grooves and then you can study them very nicely. And you can show that axonal transport is impaired. But again, it goes back to if 99.5% of the cell is cell volume is the axon, whatever you do to the cell body should probably have an impact on axonal transport. And it's certainly anything you do that has an energetic uh, consequence. Um, so, so it's very, very difficult to understand whether the axonal transport deficits that you see are a primary or secondary issue. And um, so in our, we made a mouse model of TDP43 where we, it, you know, deliberately steered it towards uh, a more humanized, mild form so that the human gene was, was inserted in a stable single copy. And uh, it allowed us to look at the early stage of a disease. So the, the motor manifestations of the mouse happen at six months. But at three months, using live imaging uh, of, of axonal transport in an anesthetized mouse, you can show that axonal transport is impaired. Mm. And certainly that's before any cell body yeah. starts to disappear. Yeah. So at least in that situation, there seems to be evidence for uh, that being a kind of pre clinical or early part of the disease. And then we've we've gone on to sort of model that again in cells in a dish with that in mind. And certainly mitochondrial bioenergetics and axonal transport are intimately related. And you can manipulate that with drugs. So we've we've done a drug screen where we've picked out a few compounds that improve uh, mitochondrial function and that improves axonal transport. So so they're intimately related. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my guess is that mostly we're probably, this is part of a, a cascade of things that are all happening at once, uh, rather than the very, the primary driver. Now, the, the only drug that been shown to have any effect in maybe slowing down the progression of ALS is uh, a drug that reduces the amount of glutamate at the synapse. Yeah. Um, it's called Rilyazol. And there's been a lot of thinking that there's hyperexcitability of neural networks that's occurring before neurons start to degenerate, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or even ALS. Um, can you talk about, okay, so that's one success, although this drug isn't, it has some beneficial effect. It's not real dramatic. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the failures of various drugs? Because you're talking about all these mechanisms, you know, mitochondrial, you know, energy, mm. depletion, impaired transport, uh, altered calcium regulation, uh, and so on. But as, as unfortunately has occurred in a lot of neurodegenerative disorders, things that seem to have some effect, beneficial effect in cell culture and animal models, when you go to the clinic, uh, they seem to be ineffective, or if they have any effect, you can't pick it out just maybe based on hmm. the fact that one thing is, once a person's diagnosed with ALS, those are already neurons degenerating. So the treatments have, you know, by definition, has started well into the disease process, where in a lot of the clinical, or sorry, preclinical models, like a SOD1 mutant mouse, for example, usually, actually, the treatments are started before the animals start to develop discernible motor dysfunction. So it's more of a prevention or, or delay in the onset type of scenario versus actually treatment. Mm. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of, I mean, summarizing the kind of reasons why uh, a lot of very kind of impressive preclinical biology hasn't translated is difficult, really. But I think number one is the complexity of the, the biology, really. So I don't think anybody like me thinks that what, you know, one 
drug is going to make a difference in this disease, really. I mean, it might do if you get some sort of magic bullet if you're lucky, but that's that's not looking like it's happening. No cancer is really treated successfully with one drug for good reason, because there are lots of escape mechanisms that tumors use, etc. So, so I think you know, we 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 our model of let's take a drug and try it in patients who are, as I've mentioned, hugely heterogeneous in terms of etiology, and expecting that to work is flawed, full stop. But the way the drugs are selected, historically, it's either been because, so I mean, pharma, you know, they have a drug and they think they know the mechanism of action, then they go looking for a disease sometimes in which to, to apply it. And, um, you know, that's understandable, but it's not necessarily logical either. And so, so Rinizol, for example, was, has been tried in lots of different things and, and it was never, you know, it didn't, didn't come out of any preclinical ALS research. It came out of a potentially plausible mechanism. Yeah. And um, it's never really shown much effect in any of the ALS models, really. It doesn't make oh. SOD bias live longer, for example. Um, so it does seem to have an effect, but it's extremely modest. So that when we see patients in clinic, actually, I can't, unless I remind myself by looking at the notes, I can't tell which who's on really and who can't. And the patients don't feel better. They just maybe get worse more slowly, but it's pretty subtle. So it's very far removed from what we really need. And um, again, you know, the assumption is, well, Rinizol is working as a glutamate antagonist. Well, it has other functions. You know, it's got effects on the sodium channels and calcium channels probably as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit pharmacologically dirty and no one's really sure how it's working. And once the drug goes through a trial, it gets licensed. People stop thinking, you know, they stop saying, well, actually, maybe we should really understand how Rinizol is having an effect. And maybe we can get better forms of Rinizol. But that process doesn't really, it's the, the drivers to that are not there in the commercial world. So you have a kind of, crazy kind of uh, system where there's a, there's a sort of anarchic approach to this yeah. historically where where everyone's doing their own little thing and each pharma company is is modeled to produce a drug that's going to get out there and be in the market what you really need is only you need you need to have a deep understanding of how a drug might be working you want to know it's engaging plausible targets if, that are als relevant so you want it to really perform across a whole range of models i would say um, so that's the approach that we are taking now, you know, of, of looking at multiple genotypes, multiple model systems, zebrafish and cells and mice and all the rest of it, trying to build evidence that this is a reproducible effect that's disease relevant. And and if you do that, you have a slightly higher chance than if you go, go into patients, you want to show that the drug is really engaging the target you, you, you think it's engaging in an experimental medicine study before going into a big study of efficacy. But the other thing is, as I said earlier on, really, what people have done, and it's perfectly kind of logical, or it was logical in 1993, let's make a toxic model, you know, so the SOD mouse was produced in 1994, very rapidly, and it contains 25 concatenated cDNA copies of the human SOD gene with a G93A mutation, which is randomly integrated somewhere in the genome. Yeah. And it turns out about tenfold uh, excess of SOD protein. And actually, if you look hard enough, you can find problems with that mouse in the neonatal period. Um, and so it has a very aggressive disease, yeah. Yeah. which almost certainly what it's done, that, that model has loaded the end stage yeah. into the model without really giving us an opportunity to see what's going on earlier. And actually, there are many ways in which you can make mice live a bit longer in experimental systems. You know, mice facilities are strange places where, you know, the kind of, you know, inflammatory drivers of the environment may have a big role to play. You know, you can you can make mice live 10 percent of the disease course longer. And that seems to be the kind of stereotypical readout from drugs that have been tried in the SOD mouse, suggesting actually that there's some kind of artifactual uh, improvement in survival. So looking at survival in mice in that model has been a very bad idea and we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, so, that, so I think it's about it's about the complexity, it's about the, the inadequacy of the models, it's about a failure to understand at sufficient depth in patients that you are really kind of taking a drug in that engages the disease. All of those things, I think, are improving a lot as we move forward, but that's why we failed in part, apart from the fact it's a tough problem. Now, uh, you know, you talked about TDP43 and C9 or 72 are there animal models now with those uh, mutations? Well, there are lots and lots of TDP mice. We've made 
some and others have made some, they're probably 30 or 40. Many of them get published and then never seem to be used again. And the, the problem is that, um, I mean, they're all made in different ways. So if you overexpress TDP, you've got the same problem. This is a, a protein which has a very, very tightly controlled kind of um, physiological level. And if you increase it by between two and threefold, you already see toxicity, which is simply a manifestation of overexpression. And actually, ALS is not a disease of TDP overexpression. There are no, like in, in Parkinson's, you have patients with synuclein triplications, and that tells you that the dose of synuclein is probably very relevant. And that's not true in TDP. The dysregulation of TDP is a bit more subtle. So if you simply, you know, make a mouse with two or threefold expression, it will be toxic, but not for the reasons it's toxic in humans. If you then try and make a more kind of a physiological mouse, you, you get a milder phenotype, which is what I think you should be doing. But a lot of people don't find that very compelling because they don't see enough stuff going on. To, to that, is that a, a so-called knock-in mouse? Has someone made a TD mutant knock-in where you put the mutant gene into the endogenous mouse TDP? So, so yeah, so some people have done that. Um, those studies are, are sort of still emerging. We did it by putting in the whole human gene as a genomic construct into the Rosa 26 locus under, so it's under the human TDP promoter with all its intron exon structure in a normal mouse background so that you've got normal levels of mouse. So you're simply asking the question in that model, what does having a mutation in TDP really do to a complex cellular organism? And um, I think that's been, that's been one way of approaching it. But I mean, the reality is of all of these models, none of them, faithfully recapitulate yeah. all of the features of ALS. Now there's a lot of head scratching about that. Well, you know, but actually I don't I think we're asking far too much of a mouse model yeah. to do that. And this is a human disease which is played out in a much more complex nervous system with a different form of organization with lots of monosynaptic connections between the cortex and the spinal cord and over 50 or 60 years. So yeah. I think a, a mouse model and any other model you, you have to ask yourself what question are you asking with this model and try and answer that question and you're not going to model a disease like ALS or Alzheimer's and it's true in the Alzheimer's field too the models have not quite no. you know achieved what people had hoped initially so we have to have a very different um, and more intelligent view of modeling. Now one thing that you know so there's been this notion that people who are athletic and maybe you know, low body weight, low body fat are at increased risk for ALS. Is that, is, did that hold up? Is that a real thing? Well, I think it is a real thing, but um, initially those kind of observations came from people like me sitting in academic centers with clinics and, you know, you start seeing uh, people who are, you know, performing a uh, professional level as an athlete or in their special forces or whatever it might be, you know. And so we, we all kind of latched onto the idea that, oh yeah, these are fit people. There's a confirmation bias problem that's going on there, which one has to be very careful about. When you do epidemiological studies and you systematically ask uh, about people's lifetime exercise, which is quite a difficult thing to do anyway, then there is a signal, but it's much, it's quite subtle. So I think that there is epidemiological evidence to support it. And there is kind of clinical evidence, if you like, of what you see in front of you. I think I've come to the view that the population of people who get ALS are not exactly representative of the whole population. They are shifted slightly towards being thinner, having fewer comorbidities, and overall being more active. There are still plenty of couch potatoes who get ALS and not every marathon runner gets ALS. So it's not, there's no simple relationship here. It's a complex relationship. And, but there is a signal. And so I think, where does that signal come from? In theory, there are a number of possible explanations. One is that uh, it's got nothing to do with the exercise at all, really, that, that actually being good at what you do physically has reproductive value. Uh, it has a value in reproductive fitness. So that the, the, the variants that promote athleticism are likely to be, you know, um, selected for in a population. Now, if those variants happen to have a deleterious effect in aging, there will be no selection break on that. So, so you know, it may be that the people who 
uh, have an excess of um, the kind of architecture that makes them fit in their nervous system, uh, pay a penalty, have a small penalty to pay in getting a higher risk of ALS. But it's not, if they didn't do the exercise at all, it wouldn't make a difference. That's one, one extreme. The other extreme is that, you know, if you didn't do any exercise at all, whatever your genotype, you would never get ALS because, you know, it's the exercise that's driving this. You're sort of wearing out your nervous system in some way, or you're producing a sort of, you know, um, tsunami of, you know, oxidative stress through exercise or whatever it might be. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense in that there are so many people who, you know, do a lot of exercise who never develop any any kind of problem. So in the middle, you've got something perhaps that might make it make sense, which is that your genotype does interact with lifetime activity and exercise and increase, you know, it's one of those five or six ah, yes. steps, you know, that, that um, and there is some evidence for that in C9 or 72, although I think it's very incomplete and very early. So, 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 you know, I, I personally am open-minded. Um, I think it's by no means certain that exercise itself drives ALS, but there is, there is a relationship. It's, it's rather subtle. And that means that there is the, an actionable outcome here. You know, we don't start saying to people, oh, well, you know, we shouldn't exercise because that would be catastrophic. And actually, if you look at, I've had people, you know, I've seen two or 3,000 people with ALS now. And I've seen all sorts of behavioral responses to getting ALS. Some people, you know, give up the ghost and sit in a chair, uh, even when they've got minor amounts of disability. And those people actually deteriorate, you know, a bit more rapidly than you might anticipate sometimes. Other people who build a gym in their garage and, you know, exercise 20 hours a day, and they don't get worse more quickly. And so... It's, it's good evidence that exercise is beneficial for people with ALS once they've got it, for all the reasons you might anticipate, which are rather generic, you know, it improves their, their psychological well-being, it improves their, that, their sort of um, metabolism in general and their, their appetite and their sleep pattern and all these kind of things. So, so if it were intrinsically harmful, you might really see some kind of effect in people who've already got ALS and, and, and you don't, on an anecdotal level, at least you don't see that. So I think, I think it's highly complicated it's of great interest, that's for sure. But my suspicion is that it might simply be a marker for a genetic profile and a wiring diagram in the brain that, you know, is good in early life, but maybe not so good in later life. We've done uh, a number of the kind of simple studies where we, you know, so age is a major risk factor for AD, PD, ALS, and one intervention in, in animals anyway kind of slows down aging, the animals live longer, it's caloric restriction or yeah. intermittent, intermittent fasting. And so we we taken mouse miles of AD, PD, stroke, and found that the caloric restriction, intermittent fasting is beneficial. It, you know, one started very early on and, and kind of slowing down the progression of the disease or onset and progression. But then when we tried it in, what is probably not the definitely not the best mile of ALS the SOD1 mice it actually made things worse you know so if if we uh put them on intermittent fasting it didn't change the age of disease onset but once they started to show motor dysfunction they went downhill more quickly well that does make sense because we know that weight loss at presentation is a poor prognostic mm -hmm. factor and that could be because, you know, you're consuming muscle as food or something in a simplistic way. Or it could be that it's simply a marker for the aggressive nature of the disease. But but it's it, there are active studies with the intervention is high calorie diet uh, uh, to, to see whether you can actually shift survival that way. Um, we, we've done work looking at UK Biobank, where you've got half a million people who've now been studied for 15 years and who gave DNA at the beginning. So I was one of one of these. And about 500 of them have developed ALS in the last 15 years. And if you look at their lipid profile, it's not, uh, it's not the same as the rest of the population. And then we went into our own population in the clinic and got their old records out, going back decades before they get the disease. And you can see that their lipid profile in, in odd ways sort of shifts some years before they get ALS, suggesting there is a metabolic process going on in the few years before you get ALS. What exactly that is, I'm not sure I know, but it does involve cholesterol and other lipids. Mm 
So, so some shift in in um, metabolism it does seem to be part of the the program of the disease. And and what what is this shift specifically? Those, is it higher cholesterol in those that don't? Or... Well, I mean, because we were looking at routine uh, bloods available as part of normal clinical care, all we all we were able to look at, you know, is HDL cholesterol and VLDL, etc. So, so there's a diff, there is a shift, you know, uh, you know, in in total cholesterol and also in HDL that is it's not easy to make sense of as such, but it's it's a reproducible finding. But actually, what you'd really like to do is to look in much greater depth. And of course, membrane lipids and in, you know, including intracellular membranes may be the point here rather than intermediary metabolism as such. Yeah, yeah, we did. So you talk about membrane lipids. We did a lot of work on um, ceramides, yeah. uh, long chain ceramides. And actually we did a study in ALS uh, and got some tissue from Jeff Rothstein's group to do that and found some abnormalities there. So, mm. um, okay, to, to finish up, you know, you talked about the problems in, in drug development, the way it, you know, it hasn't worked and then maybe some of the reasons it's not working. Now, in the case of, of individuals who have a gene mutation that will, I guess, causal gene mutation for ALS, what's on the horizon in terms of a gene therapy? Yeah, so there I think one can be much more positive. Um, I mean, conceptually, that you know, we have the uh, the kind of tools now to uh, modify gene expression. Uh, using antisense, uh, using ultimately um, CRISPR, you know, if that becomes safe as a clinical application. So, so the concept is there. Um, the proof that it might work has the SOD mouse has been helpful in that regard because it showed that antisense against SOD does um, delay onset in that model and, and improve survival. And uh, Biogen. Um, Ionis and Biogen produced uh, an antisense called Tefersin, which, um, although it was said to have failed in its meeting its endpoint in clinical trials, actually, as the patients have been followed up, it's clear that it looks like it's having an effect in slowing disease progression. So the concept that this might modify disease natural history, I think, is there. The next challenge, then, is to apply this drug as early as possible, because, as we've been discussing, once you have established disease. I mean, so, so the problem is, you know, pa patients are in some kind of compensated dysfunction for a period of time. They wouldn't know anything was wrong, but something's going wrong. By the time they, they hit clinical um, horizon and they come and see a neurologist, they have used up all their compensation. So you, that's why you see such rapid change because you're just dealing with a system which has no way to go apart from downhill. So if you shift all of that back to some years before the decompensation has been you know played out and you apply the drug you could see very dramatic effects in i think in in preventing the disease so that's the challenge really which is if you can show that it has any effect at all is then how do you apply it in in the well population of gene carriers so the problem you got there is well there isn't always a tight genotype um age of onset relationship i mean it can be in some families pretty good but you know, so you're likely to want to start treating people, you know, in their 30s or 40s, you know, and so is it safe to do that? Knocking down uh, SOD1 in an, without allele-specific knockdown, so you, that's what they're doing, down to 20 or 30% of, of levels. Well, this is, a, this is a gene which is highly expressed in the nervous system throughout life. There's likely to be a reason for that. Evolution doesn't really you know, it's not promiscuous in that regard. I mean, if, if, if SOD1 is expressed in the brain in the in old age, it's there maybe for a reason. So I think there, there are all sorts of questions about, you know, if you manipulate a, a gene like SOD1, what are the long-term consequences? So being given the permission by the FDA, et cetera, to apply that drug as a clinical treatment to well people in, you know, young life or, you know, before they hit middle age, that's a big issue. Yeah. Uh, you have to really show this is going to be safe and that's the challenge and then you have probably have to have markers which tell you that you know, the disease might be starting so really good biomarkers that say well okay you've got an SOD1 mutation you are now 
five years roughly away from disease onset, we're going to give you the antisense. We don't have those markers. We have neurofilaments, which tend to become elevated about a year before the clinical effects. So there's already cells dying in that regard. That's not good enough. So one of the things that we are doing with our C9072 population is starting to look for things that might be occurring really very early, might even be leaking out into the systemic system in the hope that you might ultimately, with TDP, for example, be able to produce some kind of point of care testing that could be applied in populations as a screening tool saying, well, actually, you know, in your system, there's some leakage or something that might be important, you know, send you into the hospital and have more sophisticated tests. I mean, that is the, the long-term aspiration, I think, so that you know when you can apply these antisense therapies. C9072, there are several antisense trials. Biogen did a trial that didn't have a positive effect. And it's possibly tied up with the chemistry of, of the antisense, it's not entirely clear. Wave is a company that's doing a trial at the moment. We are one of the centers. They have a particularly specific sort of technology. So I think, you know, these are technical issues. Conceptually, it seems to me, antisense is going to have an impact. It's a question of making it safe, effective, hitting the target with specificity. That's a kind of technical, chemical, pharmacochemical kind of problem that will be sorted out. So it will take some time, but I do think antisense ultimately will be a form of precision medicine for people who are carrying genetic mutations. You know, I've often thought, you know, so <clears throat> this is just my personal view on this, but so I, I think like if my father had or mother had Huntington's disease or, um, you know, a early onset Alzheimer's disease mutation, then, you know, if I'm, say, a young person, you know, 18, 20 years old, thinking about getting married, having children, personally, I'd want to know whether I have the mutation. And, and the reason is there's ways that I could, sh there are ways currently that I can ensure that I didn't have any children with the mutation. One is to not have children and adopt. But there is another way, and that's um, in vitro fertilization and embryo selection, mm. where you can actually, you know, say, have my sperm <laughs> fertilize my wife's egg, and then you have these in this in a dish, yeah. and then you get like the early stage embryo with say eight cells right and you can genotype it and know whether that embryo carries the mutant gene and then put that in the uterus so that in theory it would be possible to eliminate some of these genetic diseases in one generation through counseling you know genetic screening and then you know providing the resources for the the prospective parents to yeah to, but there's some i know there's some ethical issues there but what yeah. are your thoughts on that you know eliminating these in few for future generations yeah well i i think it, you know i'm not sure that i see insuperable ethical issues generally right. i think there are logistical issues i mean obviously you know eliminate is quite a strong word you could do that in you know, the greater Boston area or something, probably. I mean, then, you know, you're not going to do that throughout the world. So there's always going to be a constant supply of people carrying mutant alleles um, who won't be detected. But let's assume that you were in some perfect, well, if it is perfect society where you could screen everybody and, and intervene, you know. Um, then, you know, that's that's quite a sort of big public health exercise. And the question is, what are you gaining from that? Well, you know, the, the hard end of ALS is distressing and terrible, Larissa, but it's still a disease that only has a lifetime risk of one in 400. So to tilt your public health resources at that um, when you're fighting COVID and heart disease and diabetes, et cetera, it, you know, I mean, these are obvious points I'm making, but make, make it logistically tricky rather than ethically tricky, I would say. I mean, SMA is an interesting case in point because... You know, all of these arguments about whether you give AAV gene replacement for $1.4 million a shot, or you give Nusinersin the antisense for, you know, $300,000 a year, you could screen every single woman pitching up at an antenatal appointment for carrier status and 
you know, one in um, 40 women will carry the SMN mutation, then you screen their partner. And then, you know, if they carry the mutation, you then do the appropriate tests and you could terminate or offer termination. You could eliminate SMA like that and not have to worry about whether you give antisense or AAV. But that's not really being discussed. And it's seen as an ethical problem. And I think it's because there's so much investment in the idea that you can now cure this disease. I mean, it's a, it's a miracle of molecular therapeutics, actually, SMA. It's a really remarkable story. But it's tended to kind of inflate the idea that we've got the power to kind of deal with all these things. The public health approach to this would be, as you described, you know, would be to find out who's carrying the gene mutation and offer them a way to not have a child in the first place. And personally, I think that would be quite a sensible way to go. And so if that's presented as an ethically difficult barrier, I, I struggle with that really. I mean, obviously that may just be my view of the world, um, but you know, that is a tractable project really that could be yeah. pursued. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. We're on the same wavelength there. I actually wrote an article on this. Uh, but okay, so great. We've covered, we've covered a lot of ground. I, I appreciate Kevin, you taking the time to do this. I hope the, and I'm going to put in the, the, the um, description section, some links to some review articles, including a couple of years. And what about um, that people who, someone who's diagnosed with ALS, are there ways, you know, so you're in the UK, so you'd know more about there. Are the ways for that, are they made aware of ongoing clinical trials uh, when they're diagnosed? Yeah. Um, I mean, so there are still rather few clinical trials and so rather few patients get into clinical trials, but they, ALS care in the UK is about 70 or 80 percent of people attend one of about 22 or three special centers funded by the MND Association. So we are a network of clinics which do clinical trials collaboratively and we meet once a month and talk about the studies. So uh, patients should all have easy access to trials when they exist. One of the, one of the problems though is that trial criteria are often quite restrictive. For, for good reasons, but if you've got very rapidly progressive disease, or if you've got very slowly progressive disease, you're going to be excluded. Um, so, you know, trials are looking for populations of patients in whom there's enough going on to assess change, yeah. who are able to participate because trial participation is arduous. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated sort of story, but um, Certainly, what's very striking about ALS patients is their willingness to participate in research. So we see about 10% of the UK ALS population. They are so willing to engage in what we're doing. We can do lumbar punctures in these patients, you know, four or five times over a two-year period to get longitudinal biomarker data because they want to help, even though they know it won't help them. So they're, they're an amazing set of partners in trying to help here and without without our patients we wouldn't ever get there so I think ultimately you know it will the, the landscape's changing now and it will change I think quite dramatically uh, over the next decade or so yeah good okay Kevin I hope you have a uh, happy productive 2023 and you thank you very much it's been nice to talk to you likewise goodbye bye